Let's make a start. So welcome everybody to the SUT lunchtime seminar for uh, Monday the 29th of June. Our guests today are from uh, Zupt LLC. Uh, they're both based in Houston. We have, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Keith Vickery and Aidan Thursk with us and they're going to be giving the presentation as a, as a double act. So is it, is it Aidan going first or, or Keith going? Keith will be kicking it off. Keith, Keith will start first. Okie dokie. So um, uh, as I've said, if anybody wants to ask any questions as we go along, please, please do so. Uh, I've given you, um, you've all got permissions to unmute yourselves if, if you need to do so. If you, for any reason, you find you can't, just ping me a message on the chat and I'll uh, manually <laughs> switch your microphone on for you. Okay, so over to Keith and over to Aiden, and I'll uh, I'll mute my my microphone. And hi, good good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. This is Keith uh, in sunny and very warm and sticky Houston. Uh, we hugely appreciate the opportunity to present. Um, what I'm going to do is just give you an overview of what we mean by remote survey uh, and then very briefly run through how we do inertial metrology as opposed to acoustic or taut wire or anything else. Uh, then I'm going to run off and do some discussions on what technology is changing in the industry that's allowing remote survey to more rap rapidly become fairly easy to do. Then we're going to talk about how we do remote metrologies, the sequence of operations, and then hopefully the benefits. <clears throat> Over the last, I don't know, three years, four years, we've heard more and more and more folks talking about the need for remote operations. As you see here, BP have clearly and very publicly stated that their goal is that by 2025, all inspections will be uh, performed from unmanned systems. Shell have a similar uh, statement of moving to more autonomous operations. You're seeing rig floors, drilling floors being monitored remotely uh, with uh, oversight from the beach. And basically everybody's looking to keep the intelligence and, and I need to be careful, I guess, how I say this, but they want to see the intelligence be able to remain on the beach and let the folks offshore do the work, but get support from uh, the, the, the subject experts on the beach. And what we're seeing is obviously that the current pandemic has actually focused uh, a lot more interest in remote and unmanned operations. Very briefly, when we're talking about metrology, we're talking about the ability to measure the distance uh, between two hubs, sub C, the attitude of those two hubs, sub C, and the bathymetry between those two hubs, which will allow us to have the measurements needed to fabricate uh, a piece of pipe, basically, that will connect between two structures, sub C. This piece of pipe can be connecting between a, ple a plem, a manifold, or something, and it's usually for export from a well to some sort of interconnecting system like a manifold for transmission lines to the beach. So that's what a metrology is, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, I'm sure most of you are absolutely familiar with it. The deliverables will come on to later on from a metrology, but we do them a little bit differently. We use an inertial navigation tool uh, and basically a very brief sequence of what we do is we get as much information from the client prior to heading offshore to allow us to plan for the job, to generate task plans, to generate procedures. Then we mobilize, in the case of a remote job, the equipment to the field. Then uh, we check our communications to the field. And then when the client actually wants to complete the work, we sequence through the, the, the series of tasks shown below uh, where we align the unit sub C, we measure the distance between uh, sorry, we measure the attitude of the two hubs, hub A and hub B, be it, let's say, at the well or the PGB and the manifold. We collect heading, pitch and roll data for the two hubs. 
Then we collect our position loop data. So we're going from hub A to hub B, back to hub A. We call that a loop. That's the way we collect and control the accuracy of an inertial metrology. We look at difference in height or difference in depth between the two hubs. Then from the hub to the mud line, because obviously if we have a classic jumper, we want to make sure that jumper is clear of the mud line underneath the, the connector at each hub. So we look at the step height between the hub and the mud line. Then we do the bathymetry survey along the jumper route to make sure there's no obstructions, to make sure the jumper would be clear. Or if it's a horizontal jumper, to make sure there's no piles of cuttings or something along the jumper route. When we've completed the metrology data collection, most clients want the deliverable. And we'll show you some images of a, a very classic metrology deliverable later on. Most clients want those within 24 hours. Some clients want them within 12 hours. Uh, and a, a normal survey contractor will deliver horizontal distance, vertical distance, heading, pitch, and roll for hub A, hub B, and perhaps an AutoCAD file of the bathymetry along the route. Most survey contractors will not deliver isometrics. The engineering company involved in the subsea hardware engineering will actually deliver the isometric drawings. And again, I really like interactive presentations and folks that want to challenge or question as we're moving through a presentation. So if you've got any questions at any time, please just unmute and shout at us politely, nicely. Just to give you some background, uh, I want to keep this totally non-commercial, but just so that hopefully you understand, we might know what we're talking about. We've co completed something like 250 metrologies around the world to date. A lot of work in West Africa, uh, Angola, Congo, Ghana, Nigeria uh, should be included in there. Work in the Gulf of Mexico, very minimal work in the North Sea. We've done one job years ago in the North Sea. Uh, we've worked with ROVs, we've worked with divers, we've worked from barges, from rigs, and from vessels of opportunity. Uh, in doing this sort of volume of work, you come across multiple different connector types, multiple different tooling types, and multiple different mechanical interfaces. And whenever we quote work, one of the first questions, or whether we receive that call about, do you think you could come do this work? One of our first questions is, what is the mechanical interface into the structure? What sort of receptacle or tooling will be needed for us to couple into the structure? So if there's any engineering folks out there listening to this, when you, when you start to uh, look uh, through supply chain for a metrology service to be provided, making sure that that preliminary data is available, dimensional control data is available to show where that receptacle or mechanical interface is with respect to what we call the hub reference face or the connector reference face, all these sorts of things are needed. So that just gives you some idea of the track record that we have, lots of different customers out there. Um, and some of these metrologies, the majority of these metrologies, sorry, have been done uh, in, in a classical fashion where there is nothing in place sub C between the two structures we're working with. But a small majority nowadays of the metrology work we're doing is where there is a jumper in place. Uh, so the tooling and the interface to the structures is very different when there's a, a jumper already in place uh, because we have to go in and we have to develop custom tooling to allow us to attach to, the, to attach to the structures that are down there. And what is happening is we're seeing folks wanting to replumb the seabed so they can add a, another well into maybe an already uh, fairly cluttered existing well pattern subsea, or they've got a problem with a subsea structure and they want to add another subsea structure in prior to taking the systems that are down there offline. So what we call jumper in place metrology to becoming more common uh, in those instances, we'd like folks to think about how we get in there, how we do the work with tooling, etc. Uh, uh, perhaps in a, in, a, in, a, in a much at a much earlier date. One of the classic questions we or comments we get back from folks when we start to raise the question about providing remote surveys, and by remote surveys, we mean none of us are offshore, just our equipment is offshore, but all of the all of the folks that are actually going to be collecting the data and processing the data are onshore. And the classic comment we get is, but hang on a minute, bandwidth doesn't work offshore. There is no bandwidth. Whenever I'm offshore and I'm 
want to pick up my email, it takes hours for me to download a 500k attachment. And I guess the fundamental comment I, I sort of bounce back in with a smile on my face is, if you really want to binge watch your favorite next Netflix show, uh, you can't do it over a dial-up connection or a limited DSL connection. So we've all upgraded to some sort of decent connection this morning or this afternoon, this evening. We're all on a Zoom call with a reasonable connection. And many of us are on that connection from our home. Uh, and, and we now sort of expect that bandwidth to be available. There is a limit on satellite bandwidth, but that limit is usually an artificial limit on a vessel because the vessel operator or the contractual relationship around that vessel means that either the client or the vessel operator is not paying for bandwidth or they're throttling the bandwidth down. And if that's the case, then bandwidth will be an issue. But in nearly all cases, there is an opportunity to buy additional bandwidth. Uh, one of the other things that we've discovered uh, over the time in starting to get involved in remote, remote survey services, that in most cases, but certainly within the operators, it's beginning to become a little bit easier within the contractors. The bandwidth on a vessel is managed by an IT department because that's the historical group involved in it. And all they're really worried about is security of the networks. And they aren't thinking about the added operational efficiency of the operations by opening up that bandwidth to third party contractors. And one of the fundamental take homes that I would hope you take away from this presentation is, if you go out to the major providers of bandwidth today that are being offered on vessels, and you ask them to open up the connection on a vessel, let's say by an additional 512 kilobits per second from the vessel to the beach, and 128 kilobits per second from the beach to the vessel. So we just want them to make that pipe a little bit thicker in diameter to get our data back to the beach. The cost for them to do that for a month, the cost with the satellite bandwidth provider to provide that additional bandwidth for a month is less than or the equivalent of one day's day rate for one of my surveyors. So when we talk about enabling remote operation, bandwidth is available. Bandwidth can be purchased. The satellite uh, bandwidth providers are very, very well structured to switch on additional bandwidth by the day in some instances, most certainly by a week, they will up the bandwidth allowance into that vessel for a seven day period for a very cost effective amount of money. If we're talking about a contractor like Zupt who is turning up on a vessel, providing a service for a few days and then leaving again, in the short term third party provider space, it, at times it can be very difficult to find the right point of contact within the client organization or the vessel operators organization to actually get that additional bandwidth switched on. What I wanted to sort of take a, a sideways note on here is, is just to sort of give you, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but just to give you an update on where satellite bandwidth is, where through space communications are going. All of the major current vendors in this space, RigNet, Speedcast, Marlink, uh, uh, Inmarsat, and ITC Global, their, their method of uh, selling bandwidth and their, their value, uh, value proposition is changing dramatically. I subscribe to plenty uh, satellite communications newsletters and a very interesting one I read perhaps just two weeks ago was that within the near term, uh, we believe we're going to see sa satellite bandwidth cost tumble even further. And what folks are talking about is they're talking about a megabit per second per month. So contracting to a satellite communications provider, and this is a volume price, this is not a very short term add-on price, but we're looking at something like $200 per megabit per second per month for satellite bandwidth. And what was really interesting to see the actual cost of that for the satellite provider, just to understand their margins, it looks like with the, the, the uh, geostationary uh, conventional uh, uh, orbit satellites, the actual co cost per megabit per month is in the sort of region of $5. So this is a huge margin business and even the geostationary, the current players in the game, parts of the market have room to move. 
the the new boys on the block, the Starlinks, and there's there's several other versions of Starlink, and this is Elon Musk's SpaceX organization through their subsidiary Starlink. They are launching 60 satellites at a time at the moment on their on their uh, rockets, and currently Starlink have 530 of their constellation already deployed, and by the end of 2021, their target is to have a, an operational constellation up there of about 1,600 satellites. Um, scarily enough, Starlink and SpaceX have approval from the FCC. The FCC here in the States are now working with the ITU, and their total constellation footprint in the sky, they're talking about 30,000 low Earth orbiting satellites. On my next slide, I sort of jumped to the middle of the next slide. When we talk about geostationary satellites, we're talking about latency in the communications in the uplink and downlink of, in a, on a good day, let's say 650, 700 milliseconds. So when you're looking at control, let's say we're trying to do some this isn't an issue for us, but if we're trying to do some control of an ROV from the beach offshore, latency is a huge issue. So the geostationary market, which is the current providers today, we have fairly significantly latency through them. We've actually had completed remote metrologies where we've had six seconds of video latency, and that hasn't been an issue for us. The amazing thing about the, the low Earth orbiting satellites is because they are so close to the Earth, the latency and the communication bandwidth that the LEO service providers will be giving us will be on the order of 20 to 50 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds at the high end. So basically, we're going to see near to no latency in LEO delivered bandwidth offshore, and we're going to see the price of that bandwidth tumble. Interestingly enough, the, the plethora now of flat panel and low profile antennas and let's just call them modems or terminals there's different language used in the satellite communications business but let's just call them a an antenna and a modem to a switch there's a, an rf transceiver a block up converter known as a buck and a and a down converter known as LLM, an lmb included in this image in the bottom right hand corner of the screen that is all contained in a flat panel assembly that will fit onto the top of a normal SUV. So in the images up above it, you see a classic, this is a, obviously a luxury lot, not an offshore supply vessel, but the classic domes that you'd see for primary, secondary, perhaps TV communications on a vessel are gonna be replaced by the image on the left where you're literally seeing, this is a Kymeta image, four flat panel uh, antenna separated around the superstructure on the vessel and those four flat panels will will be sharing the downlink and sharing the uplink. Uh, these antenna spreads, the ThinkCon one in the bottom right hand corner, are currently not that inexpensive but compared to conventional domes they are. So you can go to the streets today and for very low volumes buy a uh, ThinkCon complete unit uh, as seen in the bottom right hand corner there for about eighty thousand seventy thousand ninety thousand dollars it depends on the power of the buck converter the buck converter is what gives you the power and you'll vary the the buck power level depending on where you are in the world and, and what part of the the satellite beam that you're trying to talk into the the arrival of the leo satellite revolution that is going on is absolutely dependent upon these low profile and flat panel vendors getting it right. So you're literally looking at the, in perhaps one to two to three years, the hardware required to have a satellite modem or a satellite terminal, let's just say in your house in, in Angola in the next two years, that, that price point is being targeted at sub $2,000. So we are seeing a radical change in the provision of hardware, a radical technical change in the provision of antennas, and also a huge supply of bandwidth coming towards us in a tsunami, which will all be good for us. We will be able to take serious advantage of that. 
So one of the subjects that I wanted to sort of introduce here, we're not there at the moment as Zapt, and very few people are not there, but I believe within the next six to 12 to 18 months, you're gonna find short-term providers of offshore services trying to provide remote service capability. I won't say remote survey capability, but let's say remote service capability, our services survey. They will actually be providing that service with their own uplink, downlink. There's a bunch of issues there. Does somebody have a question? No, nope. I think somebody just switched their mic on. Um, so no questions, I'll keep going. If we talk about actually putting third party uplink uh, satellite comms capability onto a vessel, we've then got to start thinking about placing that on the vessel for visibility to the SV satellite vehicles. We've got to think about the RF spectrum management um, with regard to interference to other coexisting existing satellite communications on board the vessel. None of this is an issue. It can all be managed. And even, even very early on, like today, as I mentioned on the last slide, Kymeta are already offering a dual redundant solu solution that shares flat panel antennas. And that's available in basically Pelican cases for a quick deployment today. That's a totally comprehensive antenna uh, modem switch power supply solution. So you've basically got a, 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 a normal network switch is your interface to that deliverable. Any questions? Moving back to remote metrology. So when we say remote, we have absolutely no survey personnel offshore. Uh, what we do is we ship the equipment out. We actually package and prepare the equipment slightly differently uh, than we do for manned work offshore. It will make it easy for the ROV team to assemble the equipment to the ROV and deploy it. Once we've shipped it offshore, we ship it out early to make sure they've got it early. They will then connect it up, the RO, they being the ROV team, who are used to making up cables and connecting up equipment to their ROV. They will connect it up and we'll do an, a comms check. We'll do a communi communications check. And this is just like we do when we actually turn up offshore ourselves. The first thing we do is drag the equipment up to the ROV deck. We will do a loopback test through the serial ports they give us to make sure we've got communications down to the connector on the ROV. We'll check power on the V on the ROV to make sure we've got the 20, usually 24 volts and they can deliver the power we need and the polarity is correct. Once we've connected up and done the comms check, the equipment will stay on standby until when the client or when the schedule on the vessel is ready for the metrology to start. And then basically we'll sit in our office waiting for that metrology to start and bring comms up a few hours before, make sure everything's working. And then we'll just log into our CPIN system, which is our inertial navigation system on the ROV. We'll bring up video, bring up voice, and we're ready to do the metrology. The CPIN system, our tool, uh, which was seen in one of the earlier slides, is communicating to us onshore. So we're sending commands to it. We're receiving data from it, excuse me, onshore. The uh, software we're using onshore is exactly the same as the software we'd be using offshore to collect the data. And we're reviewing and QCing the data, and Aiden's going to go into that in a little bit more detail in a minute onshore as we're collecting the data and then we'll deliver the data uh deliver the reports just as we would as if we're offshore for the client we can be providing data to them as we're collecting data onshore just like we provide data to them offshore for client-based qc so our remote metrology track record the first metrology was performed as you can see here in the middle of 2017 and to date, we've completed 12 completely remote metrologies and three remote buoy sets. So if you're going to spun a well and you want to put a buoy pattern down to bring the conductor down to the seabed, line the conductor up with exactly where you want to spun it into the seabed, most folks are going to deploy, let's say, a four buoy pattern 
around the location. Usually these boys are placed on a, on a square of 60 inch sides. So we've done three remote boy sets and 12 remote metrologies. And the most recent remote metrology in May of this year or June of this year, Aidan will go into it in a little bit more detail, uh, was, was interesting because the client was planning on using a different vendor. What's involved in a system? So this is your classic white van man's van here in this image on the right hand side. And you'll see a few packing cases and a very small pallet with some lifting hardware on it. That's a complete spread of our equipment. So in the back of that van, we've got two C-pin systems. We've got uh, the tooling stabs on the pallet and those tooling stabs are fully assembled so that the ROV guys just roll C-pins into the middle of it, do up four bolts and it's ready to be, to be deployed in a manipulator to the seabed. The cabling, uh, we actually use pressure balanced oil filled cabling uh, for nearly all of our operations. It's more reliable uh, and can suffer abuse more than other uh, conventional neoprene or rubber style cabling. The cabling box and then PCs and a CTD, a conductivity, temperature and depth sensor to give us the density of the water column. We'll also run barometers for atmospheric pressure for delivering absolute depth. And then if we're actually flying the bathymetry route rather than stepping the bathymetry route, we'll use an altimeter and a speed of sound sensor to make sure we're scaling the altimeter correctly. Usually what we use is a digital pressure transducer, which is a very, very much a standard in the survey business to collect uh, the pressure of the head of height of the water column above the pressure transducer, which we then can convert to depth using precise CTT data collected from that instrument. So how does it work? What are we doing? It, it, there's no rocket science to this at all. We've got the, we've got the uh, C-pin system connected to the ROV. The C-pin system takes uh, a 384, 38,400 bits per second connection through the ROV. It takes 24 volts, uh, about three amps or 75 watts to power the CPIN system. And that's a very classic survey port on an ROV. So we'll connect, the ROV guys will connect CPINs to the ROV. And then through the ROV's MUX system to the surface, they will send that serial string up to the surface and it will be available in the ROV control room or the ROV shack as we call it. In that ROV shack with the ROV control room, we will have a small Pelican case based 19 inch rack of equipment. And in that 19 inch rack of equipment, we will have a Moxa uh, serial to ethernet server. We will have a video encoding device. Uh, we've used several different video encoding devices. I will have an IP phone and we'll have a managed switch. We'll also have a managed power supply so that from the beach we can switch things on and switch things off through the internet connection or the bandwidth connection into that rack of equipment. From the beach, sorry, from offshore to the beach, we need either 256 kilobits per second, and I'm being very specific in the sort of bandwidth definition here because there's lots of confusion, confusion out there between board, uh, gigabits per second, gigabytes, so we're going to stick to bits per second or kilobits per second, thousands of bits per second. If video in video often today is multicast, that means that the client or the operator is actually transmitting ROV video to the beach. We'll call that multicasting. If video is being multicast by the client, we do not need to manage the transmission of the video to the beach. In that instance, the 256 kilobits per second is all we need from the vessel to the beach. In that 256 kilobits per second, we'll be sending the 38.4 kilobits per second CPINs data and a voice link. Again, if voice comms into the ROV room are provided through a normal IP phone line, and we don't have to provide that phone bandwidth, then we can live on an even thinner piece of bandwidth. So again, we don't need a lot of bandwidth if video is being multicast and if there's an IP phone system going into the, the ROV control room, which there nearly always is. 
But if we need to be self-contained and we need to send everything over this link, we need at a minimum 512 kilobits per second. That is just getting down into the weeds technically. That is H.265 encoded high definition video down sampled to about five frames a second uh, and, and, and fully compressed. Uh, so that gives you some idea of the bandwidth needed. And again, remember that that sort of bandwidth, the 512 kilobits per second bandwidth, to pay for that to be added to the existing bandwidth on the vessel for a month is the same cost of one of my guys for a day offshore. When you define satellite bandwidth, it's a little bit different than going to your normal cable provider or in the UK BT or wherever you're getting your, your, your bandwidth from because satellite bandwidth is sort of sold per bit they're interested in what it is from offshore to onshore, what it is from onshore to offshore. And then they have different definitions on the availability, or we might want to think of it as quality of service. But in the offshore bandwidth world, we talk about CIR, confirmed information rate, or, or absolutely available bandwidth to you as a user. So you'd normally define, if you really want to define this connection, it's a CIR, 512 slash uh, 128 connection, the 512 from offshore to onshore, 128 from onshore to offshore, and the CIR means we absolutely need to have that bandwidth available to us. So again, C pins, single channel, comes up to the surface, and then we plug the DB9, the serial connector, into the back of this mock support that you see here in the front on the right-hand side of the screen, the MOX support, this, this particular MOX device has four serial channels. We're primarily only using one of them. The nice thing about this device is it, it publishes its, its IP address on the panel there you see on the, the right hand side of the device. So if you ever have any issues with regard to configuration, somebody can walk up to it, can look at it. We also have serial method, uh, sorry, software methodology available to us through different software tools uh, where we can actually use a laptop instead of a MOX device to connect remotely to this technology offshore. The video, again, video encoder. There's a very common standard H.264 that many folks use. The current sort of state of the art, but not the bleeding state of the art is H.265. That basically to get the same quality image over that link, the difference between 264 and 265 is 50%. So you're saving half of the satellite bandwidth by jumping to a 265 encoder. Voice is just a phone link. I'm gonna hand over this presentation now to Aidan. He's gonna take you through what we do with regard to real-time quality control, what we do with regard to deliverables. Uh, does anybody have any questions for me? We'll be available for questions here shortly at the end of the presentation. Uh, if no questions, I'm gonna hand things over to Aidan. Yes, thank you. I did just want to go over some final notes, uh, just to take a few more minutes of your time. Uh, I where We keep mentioning remote metrology, but again, a lot of this can apply to remote survey or remote operations offshore in many different facets. Regarding quality control of our data, we're seeing real-time data being quality controlled by our onshore surveyors. This data can be sent to a client at any point in the metrology, but we do want to make sure it's clear that data is being sent directly onshore. It isn't collected offshore and then sent onshore. We need six good position loops uh, in our data. So sometimes this takes a little bit of time, but we're seeing this in real time as we're collecting data with our, uh, with our sensor. So through the serial data coming in, uh, we're able to see as C pins moves along the, uh, with ROV, we can see if it's bumped a little bit and we can see uh, while it's in a static position where we need for data collection. We're able to see this in real time onshore. We're confident when the standard deviation of our readings are within 65% of the client specifications. At this point, we will have ROV recovered to the surface. After our data collection is complete, we'll be begin uh, our offshore deliverable. Uh, Keith mentioned that we like to supply this within 24 hours and whenever it's necessary, we'll supply this within 12 hours. We think that this is very important that if we're pushing for remote operations, that there isn't any further delay in which we have if we're offshore at one point, the client needs their deliverable for the jumper fabrication. 
Our offshore deliverable is a three page document that outlines all of the required information to prepare for jumper fabrication. Here is an example here uh, where we just have a easy to read simple format. And the purpose of this is to ensure that there's no confusion as this is transmitted through the client's uh, uh, office as well as other contractors necessary for I keep using the jumper fabrication as our example of our metrology. Here's just a second page. Again, these can be put in client-based formats. Uh, this is just information that we're loading into a offshore deliverable formatted sheet. The difference between remote and man metrology, we always have a uh, risk uh, thought to be associated with it, but to date, we have not had any communication issues at all. Any comms issues regarding serial channel, baud rate, and TXR crossover, all of these have been solved before the metrology through a simple interfacing test. Nothing has necessitated that our personnel are physically there to help. At this point, if we were offshore, we would typically be asking for ROV help to help interface and, and troubleshoot throughout the serial connection. At this point, we could be doing this over the phone line or through the task plan that we have. We do believe that there's less risk associated with remote metrologies um, more than manned metrologies. And this holds true for much more than metrologies. This is a remote solutions versus manned solutions. Remote solutions remove extra bodies from offshore allow for much more flexibility in the project timeline and makes the bidding stage of a project much more predictable and true as we're providing lump sum rates as we know what our fixed costs are going to be. We know how long our equipment will be gone uh, and this could hold true as I mentioned for any service for most services, I should say. You don't have to be worrying about the visa and travel logistics, especially today. Additional days for international personnel to be mobilized early as a contingency additional equipment or personnel days when the metrology date is delayed, or finally you're rushing to demobilize the equipment and end equipment rates. Uh, in a recent metrology, as Keith mentioned, in May, our remote metrology, the original bid was for uh, another contract to be completing this metrology, but due to our current circumstances, we weren't able, they weren't able to have personnel mobilized offshore. We were asked if we would be able to send our equipment to the Gulf of Mexico offshore, and we absolutely were. And we went through a simple interfacing test before the metrology date, sorted out any issues that we had. And this is with the group that we had never seen our equipment before and had never and weren't prepared initially uh, or trained otherwise. A simple Zoom call beforehand and some videos that were sent in a Dropbox offshore was all that's necessary to create, uh, to have the metrology go as smooth as it should. The entire service is provided at lump sum cost and you have access to the equipment for a fixed number of days. It's a defined efficient use of our equipment, uh, of any equipment, and you have consistent and compact uh, footprints for each metrology. Here's just a quick example of a timeline that you'll see with one of our services. Uh, you'll have the equipment shipped from our office here in Houston. The equipment will arrive offshore. The interfacing test will be done well ahead of time. The metrology is completed. The deliverable is given within 24 hours and then the equipment can be demobilized at your convenience. As can be seen in the photo, our team does exactly what they would do offshore, but instead of data being collected in a, uh, offshore, it's done in a client's office or ZUP's office here in Houston. Keith mentioned our, the latency that we've had, we've had up to six seconds before. The nature of our task plan means that video, is, uh, video latency is mostly a non-factor. While this not may while this may not be true for all operations that have remote capability, CPINS isn't collecting data while we're in motion. So the video is a reconfirmation that our sensor is sitting in the correct position, it's stabbed into the hub as it should be, and there's no need for us to be uh, demanding high definition, uh, zero latency video. While this is coming soon, uh, there's lots of operations where video is a reassurance and absolutely not necessary to have incredible bandwidth requirements. That is all we have for you today in terms of our slideshow. Uh, it'd be great to field any questions that anyone has.